A brief history of the monad. The concept of the monad can be found in many ancient texts. Probably the earliest was the Great Hymn to the Aten, composed by the pharaoh Akhenaten, who ruled Egypt from 1353 to 1335 BCE. It describes the abstract solar disk, the Aten, as the one and only god, the dispeller of darkness, the single source of light and mind in the universe, and giver of all life. The androgynous Aten exists beyond duality in a state of unchanging oneness. Unlike other gods, the Aten has no human traits or weaknesses. It simply exists in the monistic light of pure awareness and by that existence causes all else to exist. One of the most beautiful statements of monadic philosophy ever written was the Tao Te Ching, Book of the Way by the ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu. It describes the Tao as the single absolute principle underlying reality, combining within itself the dualistic principles of yin and yang. The Tao is not something that should be worshipped, but rather sensed in the feeling of being alive as the field of awareness underlying the natural order of things. The source of the Tao is eternally nameless because it can't be grasped by the human mind, but it can be defined from what it's not, any of the countless named things that are its manifestations. So, if it can be named, it's not the Tao. Also in the Tao Te Ching, we find a basic statement of the principle of divine emanations that was the central framework of the Pythagorean cosmology. Lao Tzu wrote, from the Tao comes one, from one comes two, from two comes three, and from three comes the ten thousand things. A new understanding of monadic reality was introduced around 520 BCE when the Indian ascetic Makali Gosala popularized the Jainist theory of the Jiva or life monad, which is an everlasting subtle substance each person possesses that originates with the greater monad or Godhead. Jivas are personal monads that are infinite in number but bound to the cycle of rebirth in which they continually adapt to new physical bodies. Jivas that attain liberation from bodily existence rise to source monad, where they remain forever in an immobile state of perfect knowledge and bliss. The mythic figure of the Egyptian sage known as Hermes Trismegistus became the vehicle for centuries of monadic philosophizing. Hundreds of influential texts were written in the name of Hermes beginning around 100 BCE. The 17 texts of the tremendously influential Corpus Hermeticum, dating from 200 to 300 CE, were attributed to him, and scores of pseudepigrapha texts produced by Hermes Trismegistus were written well into the 11th century CE. In hermetic diagrams of monad cosmology, the circular monad is often shown projecting the logos of creation in three emanations of light. All the pure archetypes of the one mind, everything from alpha to omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, are projected in the first emanation. In the second emanation, they are depicted as originating in the fiery divine command of fiat lux, let there be light, into the black emptiness of the void. Finally, in the third emanation, the original light is shown filtering into the manifested world as mind the maker, or the mind of nature. Hermes described the monad as an intelligent sphere whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. And in some books, he states that the monad can uniquely beget another monad or groups of monads. Texts attributed to Hermes describe the monad as the one mind that projects reality into the chaotic blackness of the cosmic abyss known as the one thing. The monad became the supreme being of Gnosticism, a religious movement that originated among Jewish and Christian sects in the first century CE. Some of the venerative titles they gave the monad were the absolute, before the beginning, and the depth of profundity. 
The Gnostic monad is above and beyond everything and exists in a state of infinite incorruption, expressed in its pure light into which no eye can look. The Christian Gnostic Valentinus described the monad as the source of the pleroma, the spiritual cornucopia of infinite fullness from which the universe sprung. The Gnostics' version of the dyadic emanation from the monad, or mind the maker, was the demiurge, the divine force in nature responsible for fashioning and maintaining the physical universe. For Gnostics, the unforgiving God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, was the demiurge, not the monad. The Gnostics were condemned by Neoplatonist Greek philosophers for their theocratic treatment of the monad, and they replaced it with a more abstract view of the first being. The Pythagorean idea that the universe comes from emanations of consciousness and that the physical world is a reflection of eternal forms or archetypes had greatly influenced Plato, Aristotle, and other Greek thinkers. In their philosophies, the monad was their term for the first point of consciousness, the one mind of creation. The influential Neoplatonist philosopher Plotinus described the monad as an indivisible whole without attributes that can't be any existing thing and is beyond human ability to conceive of it. For Plotinus, the monad is an unchangeable perfect oneness that is in no way diminished by all the created things that emanate from it. According to the Alexandrian scholar Iamblichus, the ineffable monad is outside time and space, but is the source of sole eternal reason, the Logos, that creates the universe. He described the monad as the realm of original thought, while the dyad is the domain of objects and the results of thought. Iamblichus added many emanations of intermediate beings to Plotinus's monadic system. The last major Greek philosopher, Proclus, further expanded on Plotinus's model by adding a layer of archetypes between the monad outside the universe and the dyadic mind the maker directly involved in creation. For him, the archetypal thoughts or ideals exist at the head of causation before their physical expression. Proclus also clarified the workings at the triad level of emanation by establishing a threefold pattern of forces that structure all levels between the monad and material reality. During the Dark Ages in Europe, attempts to reach a deeper understanding of the monad moved to the Arabian lands. Islamic scholar Al-Kindi clarified the operation of the dyad in monadic philosophy. He taught that the first act of the monad was the creation of the first intellect, which acted as an intermediary demiurge through which all things came into creation. Renowned Islamic scientist and philosopher Al-Farabi equated the monad with Aristotle's idea of the first cause. He taught that the first cause is in a state of eternal self-contemplation, which creates a reflection in a new level, or emanation, of intellect. This second intellect thinks about itself while contemplating the first cause, and in this way brings a new emanation of intellect into being. The cascade of self-reflective secondary intelligences emanating from the first cause continues until the tenth intellect, beneath which is the material world. The Persian genius Ibn Sina, known as Avicenna in the West, believed the monad was a logically necessary entity that can't not exist at the head of creation. In Ibn Sina's model, the infinite mind of the monad interacts with the human brain to create intellect and self-awareness in individuals. Part of this I am experience is the realization that we each have a permanent soul, an immaterial substance, independent of the body because it can only be perceived intellectually. The influential Islamic scholar Ibn Arabi, who wrote over 800 books, created a cosmological model of the monad that became the dominant view in much of the Muslim world. He taught that all things belong to just one entity, the monad. We are through it, he wrote, but it is not through us. We remain with our own root, which is in non-existence, yet even things which don't exist are part of the monad. 
the first rays of light of the European rebirth known as the Renaissance began to shine in the writings of the medieval genius Albertus Magnus. His student, the Dominican friar Thomas Aquinas, popularized the works of Aristotle and wrote a monumental compendium of philosophy called Summa Theologica, or Summary of Theology. In his Summa, Aquinas emphasized the absolute monadic nature of the divine, saying that it's an unchanging unity beyond what we consider infinity that subsists on the act of being. Its essence is the same as its existence. Aquinas believed the true home of an individual soul is in the monadic Godhead, although our soul is temporarily united in time and space to a body and is what animates it. The concept of a monadic universe, the Unus Mundus, Latin for one world, was popularized by the Belgian philosopher, physician, and alchemist Gerhard Dorn. For Dorn, the Unus Mundus is an underlying monadic reality from which everything emerges and to which everything returns. He taught that the final stage of personal transformation was the experience of the Unus Mundus beyond duality, in which all psychological and spiritual divisions are healed and one soul unites with the world soul. During the Renaissance, there was a resurgence of the Pythagorean teachings that emphasized the monad as the font of all possible existence. The renowned British mathematician philosopher John Dee believed understanding the monad was the key to the mysteries of the universe. He summarized his revelatory work in one of the most influential books of the Renaissance, the Monas Hieroglyphica, or Hieroglyphic Monad. In his book, Dee developed a symbolic glyph that embodied the power of the monad, and he then presented a geometric proof to unveil its mysteries. The proof began with Pythagoras's circular symbol of the monad, and then D proceeded systematically to reveal its archetypal powers using the seven planetary ciphers, used by astrologers and alchemists of his time, in their proper dynamic relationship. The resulting glyph was considered a magical key to understanding the universe. Italian mathematician Giordano Bruno expanded on the Pythagorean teachings in his De Monade, Numero et figura, or on the monad, number and figure. He described three fundamental types of monads, the greater monad, God, spiritual monads, souls, and physical monads, atoms. He viewed the universe as an infinite living presence that shared a common monadic consciousness on all levels of being. This book was one of the reasons Bruno was burned alive for blasphemy by the Catholic Church. The great German mathematician Gottfried Leibniz based his whole system of metaphysical science on the monad. For him, the monad exists as an infinite number of holographic monads, atoms of consciousness that make up the universe but lack spatial extension and are therefore immaterial or mental in nature. His book, Monadology, became the basis of both philosophy and science during the Age of Enlightenment in the 16th century, and it continues to influence and inspire modern thinkers. His system established a logical connection between atoms of consciousness and physical reality. In his Monadology, Leibniz explained that monads are indivisible and therefore can't be created or destroyed. The soul-like monads are the basic units of awareness embedded in the fabric of consciousness in time and space. They have their own subjective perceptions and appetites that form the invisible basis of the physical world. Monads at the lowest level are unconscious, unaware, and without memory, but they possess the potential to become conscious. On higher levels, monadic perceptions are pure conscious observations originating within individual monads, which remain uninformed by outside influences or objective reality. Monads can only be changed within themselves, but they have access to all the infinite forms possible within the greater monad. The famous German philosopher Johann von Goethe viewed monads as indestructible atoms of soul present since the birth of the universe. He believed they varied in their levels of consciousness and willpower. 
For Goethe, the human soul is an individual monad that could conceivably enter a new monadic state on a higher level of awareness after death. Another German philosopher, Immanuel Kant, defined human reason as the faculty of knowing archetypal logical principles that originate outside the senses and normal understanding. In his Monadologia Physica, or Monadology of Physics, he argues that monads are the ultimate principles of all bodies and states that understanding them can unite metaphysics and mathematics. British Nobel laureate, mathematician, and philosopher Bertrand Russell expanded on Kant's ideas in a new viewpoint now known as Russellian monism, in which a single source or set of properties underlies both consciousness and the physical universe. Russell wanted to create a new physics by focusing on precisely what classical physicists were trained to ignore, the underlying cause or source of physical reality. Russellian monism proposes specific properties of whatever is responsible for the dynamic structures described by physicists and suggests that those same properties are also part of consciousness itself. With the dawning of the 20th century, researchers in quantum mechanics and astrophysics pieced together a whole new vision of physical reality in which consciousness played a central role. Einstein had shown that energy and matter are equivalent in his famous equation E equals mc squared, and if that little c stood for consciousness instead of the speed of light, the ultimate science of the future would have been born. But the universe seems very reluctant to share that final secret, and physicists are still working to quantify consciousness in their equations. Erwin Schrödinger Nobel Prize-winning pioneer in quantum physics, believed the apparent multiplicity of minds in the world is an illusion and there is only one mind, a singularity in consciousness, that expresses itself in a myriad of ways. The total number of minds in the universe is one, he said, and consciousness is a singularity phasing within all beings. Other noted scientists have worked to clarify and update monadic science. The father of automation, German scientist Konrad Zuse, proposed that the whole universe is a monadic cellular automaton running on a computational structure, or program, composed of a vast array of data cells. American astrophysicist Gregory Matloff believes the universe is one monadic proto-consciousness field and has collected evidence that the stars and entire cosmos may be self-aware. Georges Lemaitre was a Belgian mathematician and astronomer who proposed that the universe exploded from a monadic singularity or primeval atom to create space, time, and matter. Lemaitre's Big Bang theory became the prevailing cosmological model of the universe. It explains the complete 13.8 billion year evolution of the universe and numerous other scientific puzzles, including the large-scale structure of the universe and the continuing expansion of galaxies. Scientists are just beginning to document the mysterious connection between the monad and nothingness, what philosophers have referred to as the abyss, the void, the no-ground, or zero-state. In 1995, American-Canadian theoretical physicist Lawrence Krauss theorized that most of the total energy density of the universe is embedded in the hidden energy of empty space, and his theory was confirmed three years later. Krauss then created a model in which the universe originates from nothing through certain arrangements of relativistic quantum fields in empty space. His model seems to agree with experimental observations, such as the energy density and shape of the universe. Scientists in the emerging field of consciousness studies have made great strides in penetrating the puzzle of mind in the universe. Bernard Heisch is a renowned German-born American astrophysicist who believes modern science and traditional spiritual traditions are describing the same fundamental single reality. In 2006, he proposed that consciousness is produced and transmitted through empty space in the quantum vacuum. The same universal vacuum from which the universe originated in the Big Bang singularity is also the source of all consciousness. 
In 2004, Italian neuroscientist Giulio Tononi developed a mathematical theory of consciousness called integrated information theory. The model links consciousness to integrated information, a mathematical function that can determine the level of consciousness of any system, from rocks to robots, from plants to humans. The tool seems to support the idea of monistic panpsychism, the view that all created things are associated with some amount of consciousness. British consciousness researcher Philip Goff argues that theories in which consciousness arises from physical processes, or materialism, and theories in which consciousness is separate from the body, or dualism, both face insurmountable difficulties. Instead, he suggests a form of panpsychism, the view that consciousness is an intrinsic part of the universe. One possibility is that the basic constituents of physical reality, electrons and quarks, have very simple forms of experience, and the evolution of the brain is related to the total awareness of its cells. Norwegian researcher Hedda Hassel Merck believes the physical sciences reveal the structure, but not the true nature, of the physical world. Her research focuses on neutral monism, which is an umbrella term for a popular class of theories that reject the dichotomy of mind and matter and suggest that the fundamental nature of reality is neither mental nor physical. In other words, it's something neutral.